any person can do. And I just want you to go away realizing there's nothing special about the soul winner. Now I've said uh, in, in uh, promoting the class a little bit, one of the things that we want to do as a church, we would consider ourselves to be a soul winning church. Probably inside of a year, we see as many people born again as we have members of our church normally. And that's one of the advantages of a small church. You know, small, large, whatever God wants a church to be is what you want it to be. But one of the advantages of a small church or a beginning new church is that you really are faced with a at a practical level with the reality that if you do not reproduce yourself, particularly in an area like southeast Florida, you'll vanish. You won't exist as a body very, very shortly. We turn over on the average year in this church, we turn over 20 to 30 people a year. Not because people leave this church or get disgruntled and, and have an issue or anything like that, but just because people move away. Or when they move here, they have a hard time making it and staying. This church would be unique versus a, uh, an older established church in the sense that... Um, we don't happen to have a whole lot of people that have been born and raised and grown up in Southeast Florida. Uh, most of those folks, if, they're, if they go to church, they grew up going to the church they go to, and they're still there. And so when you start a church, you usually don't get those folks in your church. Uh, they usually go to the church where their family goes and that sort of thing. So our church is just a little bit different in that sense. And there are many advantages in it. And the advantage is, is that you're reminded that the church is not a place where people grow up and belong to because that's where they were born and that's that's just what they've always known and they haven't changed anything. A church is a place that reaches lost people and brings them into the family. Of course, that's the purpose of the church. Now, I'm not there's there's no snide remark there. There's no cut against people that grew up in church. My parents were saved not very long before I was born and my neither my mother nor my father grew up going to church at all. Uh, if they did attend church, it would be something like an Episcopalian church uh, where, or a Lutheran church where people would meet more as a community event than a personal spiritual uh, response to you know, a, a relationship with God. It's just that's where you went. And so I remember when I was a kid asking, you know, you, you, you have, my parents grew up in the 1960s. They were born in the 50s and grew up in the 60s. And so their wedding photos are hilarious. But I, I love uh, looking at their wedding photos and then looking at the church where they were married in. And they ask, what church is that? And they're kind of like, well, I, you know, my mom knew where it was. It was a Lutheran church, but it really wasn't their church. They went to church to get married. And so for some people, that's what church is. It's a social place, a place where you get married, you get married, that sort of thing, or you go to, you know, on Easter and Christmas and all of those things. We want to encounter lost people uh, that don't know the Lord Jesus and we want to introduce him to them and see people saved, born again and have their lives radically, dramatically changed like ours were when we came to know Jesus Christ. And so uh, one of the things that is our goal in our class for the next three weeks is that we want to not just share or preach the gospel with people, but we want to be effective at winning people. We want to win people. He that wins souls is wise. wise. Don't shy away from the term soul winning, but don't use it with lost people. You ever think about the terms soul winning with lost people? You know, for lost people, you know, calling them the harvest makes them feel like they're going to get reaped. And getting <laughs> reaped implies sids and sickles. You know, <laughs> sides and sickles. And uh, just, just think about terminology of what you use. Soul winning is a term for people that understand that a wise person wins souls. So it's, it's, a, it's an in, it's an in-house term, terminology. Well, we're just out soul winning, and you tell that to a lost person. And I don't know about you, but Christians seem creepy to me with some <laughs> of the things that they say. And I think soul winning for a lost person is a creepy term because it gets the idea that, you know, I'm prey and they're predators. We're not predators. Uh, we have a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Body and snatchers. We, what's it? Yeah, body snatchers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we're trying to recruit family members. I mean, that's really what it is. Is you know, we're part of, we are part of the most unique 
uh, the best family in the world. Whatever family you were born into, you didn't have a choice about. And if they're born again, they'll always be your family. But do you know if you're born again and your family isn't born again, the body of believers, your church, those are your forever family. They're the people you're going to be with forever. They're the people that understand what you're all about, why you, what, why you think the way you do, what makes you tick. And they are the people that, you know, that, I mean, that's just, you know when you really become part of a local church body and you have family that loves you, cares for you, uh, encourages you, helps you spiritually, and is there for you, you know that there's just nothing like that family. There are all kinds of imitations of fraternity in, in life. You know, I'm amazed sometimes at how lost people get into their college fraternities. I just think sometimes fraternities are the silliest thing in the world. Uh, or organizations, even secret organizations, uh, clubs. You know, when you're a kid, you want to be part of a club, right? You want to be belong to something. And the great thing about a club, of course, is excluding people from it. You know, this is what you have to do in the club, and this is what you have to do to join our club, and by the way, you'll never be in our club. <laughs> you know, that's the sort of thing that has to do with the club or fraternity. And that sense of belonging that you get from being in when others are out, that's not the attitude we have in the church. We're part of a club that's so great and so special that we want everybody to be in it. And that really is kind of our mindset. And so, you know, when we share the gospel, we know the definition for gospel. The word gospel means good news. And so we're sharing good news with, with people. Now let me just say this. Soul winning, when we get into the practical aspects of soul winning, oftentimes uh, soul winning has similar technique to sales. But I'm not going to be teaching sales techniques. I'm not going to teach a method, you know, one size fits all. One of the things that we want to focus on in this class, and we'll get to uh, beginning next week, is that the soul winner is a unique person, uniquely equipped, specially made by God and gifted for soul winning. And the way that you're gifted is in a way that you're going to reach people no one else could reach. And you're going to reach people in a way no one else could reach them. So I don't want anyone to come away from here going, you know, okay, so when do I start memorizing my speech? When do I, you know, go down my list of answers to questions that people have so that I can give an answer uh, to an objection that someone has or so I can con convince people? No, my goal in this class, and by the way, I, I'm, not, I'm not bashing that. There, there's help in knowing answers and studying. The questions that you have, when you find the answer for, you're able to help other people. But what I want to come out of this class with an understanding is that you are uniquely called and equipped for the purpose of soul winning. And you're, you are supposed to and able to reach people that no one else can in a way that no one else can. And I just think that's wonderful, don't you? All right, now... Um, Soul winning saturation. I want to talk today about the person, the soul winner, and I'm, I'm going to oversimplify the person. Melissa's well, going to get you some water. Uh, she, she, she's getting water. Yeah, I, I know that's what you need. Um, all right, so yeah, sit down. <laughs> all right, here's what a soul winner looks like. Uh, this is, for you artist types, this is, uh, I should have autographed it. I will print and autograph. Uh, yeah, your your uh, personal uh, copy of this, but they, this is what soul winners look like. Soul winners are either men or boys or girls or women, ladies. They're one of the one of those. And so, if you're trying to identify your soul winning type, uh, you could look over here and decide: Am I a man or am I a boy? Uh, and guys, get it right. I mean, come on, seriously. And uh, if I'm a girl or a woman or a lady. And so that's what a soul winner looks like. You say, Pastor, what's a soul winner look like? Well, it looks like whatever you are. Uh, when we talk about soul winning, I'm not trying to clone people. You know, I mean, obviously, if you want to be effective soul winner, you should have a dark polo shirt with an FLBC logo on it if you want to be really good at it. You know, honestly, the truth of the matter is, is that the shirt you wear ought to be a shirt that's, you know, appropriate, of course, but ought to be the kind of shirt you wear. The clothing that you wear ought to be your type of clothing. In other words, what a soul winner 
wears is what you wear because a soul winner is just a person. And the person is a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl. Uh, you say, Pastor, duh. You know, I'll be honest with you. We have so many misconceptions in our mind that we don't agree with that. We think a soul winner, you know, is a great speaker or is quick, you know, quick-witted or is, you know, has a really, really good spiel or a really, really good presentation or is good-looking or is uh, dresses a certain way or is weird-looking, you know, or whatever. I mean, I mean, y'all know some effective, weird-looking soul winners. It's like, man, I don't want to be a soul winner. I never want to wear a co-op hat. You know, I, I remember one guy, you guys know what a co-op hat are? This is farm country stuff here. Uh, but they, before, like Tashi's wearing a flat-billed cap right here. See, that's, that's been the style, the flat-billed cap, for more than, what, 10 years now? That flat-billed caps have been. And when I was growing up, you wouldn't be caught dead with a cap like that. It had to be. Yeah, you stuck it in a cup, right, Tim? To make it look right. A ball cap, you know, and it kind of, you know, you peeked out of it with your eyes. Right? Uh, and, you know, so it was a ball cap style, but, they, you know, they wear flat build caps now. When I was growing up, that's what the co-op hats looked like. You know, the, the foam front that said co-op on it, and then the mesh on the back, and it was green or blue, and it always sat on the dash of a farm truck, you know, and it was covered in dust, and nobody ever wore them because they looked so terrible. But when you went to the co-op to dump your wheat, you got the free co-op hat and it sat on the dash and never got worn. And so, now Tashi wears that. I wouldn't be caught dead. I, I, would, I would wear a hat that says, thank God. But I wouldn't wear a hat that's flat built because it reminds me of a co-op hat. I'm fine. I'll make a trucker version of it. <laughs> trucker version. No, it's, just, it's just the era, the age that you grew up, you know. I'm three years older than you, so we grew up in a different time period. Yeah. So. <laughs> Midwest. <laughs> Midwestern. That's it. Okay, guys, get this. The soul winner looks like you. We're not trying to make you look like a different person or be a different person. Now, if the Holy Spirit's convicted you about something, then change that. But that's a matter of sin, and that's a matter of testimony, and it isn't a matter of your qualification for a soul winner. You guys know what a soul winner looks like? Very good. All right, next drawing. Oh, no, this is not a drawing. All right, so I want to give you two simple qualifications to be a soul winner. When I was in Washington State at the church planning conference a couple of months ago, I had three different people tell me the exact same thing, and I just couldn't believe they had the audacity to say it to me. And not only could I not believe they had the audacity to say it to me, but I was really kind of, you know, I was there to preach at a preaching conference, and I was not, I was on sort of a vacation from pastoring people. And so I didn't correct them, but I was shocked by what they said. Melissa and I were in Ocean Shores, Washington. Uh, is it Ocean City, Washington? Some ocean something. It's on the ocean. And uh, it's the Pacific Ocean, the left one. And we stopped at this flea market, and it turned out that the owners of the flea market were believers. And they were really sweet people. We really enjoyed uh, being there. And there was a lady that was there, and they asked me, oh, they figured out I wasn't from Washington. And they asked me where I was from, and they asked me what I did, and then, uh, you know, I told them I was a pastor. They asked me why I was there. I was there for a uh, church planning conference, that sort of thing. And then some lady that was also a believer was there. She overheard a conversation. She followed us outside, and I had to politely listen while she gave me the big speech about... You know, I just love soul winners. I just love people that preach the gospel and you, you soul winning people, you know. I just, I just can't do that. That's just something I just can't do. And, uh, you know, I've just always just admired people that could share their faith with people and win people. And I had to hear for five minutes how she couldn't be a soul winner. And, you know, I didn't correct her. I didn't say, well, you know, you're supposed to be a soul winner. Uh, but she is. But what she thinks is that a soul winner looks like some people that she knows that win souls. She thinks they look different than the person she sees when she looks in the mirror each day. And that's too bad. Because that's why our churches are so ineffective of reaching people. The reality is that this, look at the group that we have here today. There are a lot of people that would be here today that cannot be. Uh, but the size of this group here today, the truth of the matter is this group could reproduce itself several times over inside of a year. I mean, you could. I'm talking about you. You could, re you could win and disciple people inside of a year, you yourself. And you're what a soul winner looks like. Your personality, 
uh, the way that you would present the gospel, the the way that would resonate with you, you're the soul winner. And I had three or four people on that trip tell me why that they could not be a soul winner because it's just not who they are. And I have news for you. A soul winner looks like uh, a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl. If you're one of those, you can be not only a soul winner, but a great and effective one. Okay, so the qualifications for a soul winner. First of all, the first qualification is there are the two qualifications we want to look at for being a soul winner. Now, if I were to ask, well, let me just ask. You tell me, uh, without looking at these, you tell me what are some requirements, what are some things that ought to be true about a soul winner? Be saved. Yeah, you ought to be saved. Yeah, good, thank you. You need to love God. All right, so you should love God. I should love people too, huh? Yeah? Okay, what else? You need to know the Scripture. Okay, you need to know the Scripture. Yeah? Living. What? Living. You need to live the Scripture. Yeah, you need to have... What? Oh, yeah, you need to have... <laughs> yeah, you, need, you need to be a man, woman, boy, or girl, and alive. Although, you know, it's, as ironic as it is, I know many people have won more people in their death than they have in their lives. So, you know, dying sometimes can be ineffective. Way to, to soul win. My sister died in 2015, at the age of 38, and the year she died, she won more lost people than anyone in her, in her church. Mm -hmm. I think they, that her pastor told me that they knew of 28 people that got saved in a couple of months' time, the year my sister died. And she had Sunday school students that wanted to get saved that came to her bedside to be led to the Lord uh, when she was dying. And we had family members that got saved at her funeral. And my great aunt, who got saved at 100 years old, man, she got it. I mean, her whole life she resisted the gospel and, and looked at her Sunday school enrollment as her salvation, that she had been in Sunday school. And she would always tell you, I'm just as good as you, I don't need to do that. But when she knew that she was close to her deathbed, she literally stayed alive so she could get saved. She heard that Melissa and I were coming to town. When I came to town, when I came to see her in the hospital, she wore hearing aids, and so she couldn't hear anything. She'd always turn them down to save the battery, so she always shouted at you, and you had to shout at her. She, Melissa can't, could never talk to her because she can't shout loud enough, and <laughs> loudly enough. So anyway, but we're coming down the, uh, we're coming in the door, we're still in the hallway of the hospital, and she yells, I need you to make sure I know how to, that I'm going to heaven. And so we shared the gospel with her just very, very simply. I mean, I, my mom had shared the gospel with her for 40, 50 years, 40 years. Shared the gospel with her for 40 years, and she'd resisted it. And she just, she was ready to be saved. And so I just took the Bible and went to John 3. Showed her how Nicodemus got saved. It wasn't works. It was faith in Jesus Christ. And she prayed and got saved, and she said, now I'm ready to be with my Lord. And then she made sure that we knew that she wanted us to preach the gospel at her funeral. And we had family members at her funeral. So we had some family members that are Catholics. And they had really been, they're devout Catholics, very, very sincere Catholics. They never would be open to the gospel. And they got saved at her funeral. And so, yeah, you can, you can be a soul winner even in your death. You know, a person who has been born again has something to testify of and testifies of it, even in the way that they die. One thing she said, I want you to preach the gospel at my funeral. I want you to tell everybody how to be saved. I want to make sure they're in heaven with me. Um, okay, so we can talk about qualifications and requirements for a soul winner, things that you have to know, but I just want to just kind of scratch all that today and say, no, not actually. In order to be a soul winner, all those things happen, but the person, the soul winner, needs to be saved and needs to be called uh, to be a soul winner. We'll look at that briefly in a minute, but let's have some humor. Um, never uh -huh. misunderestimate what people will do in order to justify themselves by their works. They'll even go soul winning. You know, I have had, it's always boggled my mind, I've had people that are not even saved yet that want to go out soul winning. Misunderestimate's a word that George W. coined. Okay, and it's one of my favorite words. What's <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. It's me teaching the class, and so my personality gets injected into it. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought everybody wants CW. So there he is. <laughs> uh, well, the reality of it is, is that I've been surprised. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I have very often gone soul winning because I felt like it or wanted to. Do you hear me? 
all the times I've gone soul winning, I, I could probably, I, I don't remember how many times I wanted to or felt like it. I, because I, that's just not what motivates me to be a soul winner. Uh, I'm unmotivated by what I feel like and uh, what I want to do. And it's amazing to me that people that aren't even born again want to go on visitation. I've had people, hey, I want to go on visitation with you. I don't know if they want to go just to see. But actually for them, it's a work. And they like the word outreach. And they think that you're building the organization. They're like, you know, we need to grow this church. We need to get more outreach. We need to, you know, we need to, you know, have more community impact. And we need to feed homeless people. And we need to, you know, be involved in the city. And, you know, I'm not against outreach in the sense of being plugged into the city. We don't want to be isolated from our community. We need to be much more involved in our community. But that isn't what a church does. What a church does is preaches the gospel. Every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, people call me and say, are y'all feeding the homeless? Can I come and help feed the homeless? And they want to feed the homeless because they want to feel like they're doing good works. Mm. It's a good work. And they're way more interested in that than they are in uh, teaching people the gospel or seeing lives change. They don't, not, don't want to talk about that stuff's kind of you know, meddling in people's lives. They're, they don't really want that, but they want to do outreach. And some people want to go soul winning just to say, hey, there's a really nice church you know, down the street and so forth, but it isn't the gospel that motivates them. It's something else. It's the good work. We do not do soul winning to get points. We do soul winning because it's our purpose. And there's a real difference. You say, Pastor, that, that ought to be, you know, duh. You know, that ought to be one of those statements, one of those things that, you know, we, that goes without saying. No, it, it needs to be said. Because a lot of times we go soul winning because we have to, but not because we think that somebody's going to get saved and their life's going to be changed. And so, uh, never misunderestimate the, uh, what people will do in order to justify themselves by their works. They'll even go soul winning but that's not what we want to do. Qualifications for a soul winner. Well, you need to be saved. Having full assurance of your salvation will help your soul winning. When you get the gospel boiled down in the answers to the thing that everyone struggles with, which is guilt for sin, and which is a believing that Jesus died once for all and you're actually saved. Let me just ask a question. Let me pull the audience real quick. How many of you, after being saved, have ever questioned or doubted your salvation? Anybody here have a question? How, let's put it together. How many here, after being saved, have not ever questioned or doubted your salvation? <laughs> Mrs. Price is about the only one. Uh, she went to a good church. And she was growing. I'm serious. Serious. That, that's one of the things that really helped her. But you know, a lot of preaching makes people doubt the work, the miracle of salvation. You know, a lot of good preaching misdiagnoses a believer who isn't everything he should be. The misdiagnosis the problem of that person and basically blames the work of the cross. In other words, they wanted to be saved, but God didn't save them good enough to stop them from sinning. And so because they weren't saved well enough, you know, they must not be saved. Instead of dealing with victory in the, in the Christian's life. Amen. Instead of preaching about, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with the work of the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, He died for your entire life. Mm -hmm. He gave His entire life for yours. And so He died not only for the sins in your past, He died for your future sins as well. They're all fully paid for. You're, you're saved. You're born again. And you're not born again because of how much you believed or the words that you prayed or how sincere you act. You're born again because of a free gift, because of something that was done on your behalf and because you receive Jesus. And faith, my friend, is as simple as looking to the cross. It isn't praying hard enough, being sincere enough in your heart. It's the desire to be saved and receive the free gift. And anyone who's saved understands, I need salvation, and I asked for it, and I received it on the basis of God's ability, and not mine. But it's very difficult to be a soul winner if you don't have assurance of your salvation. In other words, if you think that you're saved because of anything you do, you will preach a confusing gospel. You'll preach a confusing gospel. You think being saved is all about I was terrible and now I'm a good person. You'll, you'll preach a confusing gospel. I love a testimony of a, of a changed life, don't you? I know a lot of people that when they got saved, God changed their lives. 
It's a great testimony of the power of the, and work of the Holy Spirit and of the effectiveness of victory in the life of a believer. But your changed life isn't the gospel. The cross of Jesus Christ is the gospel. Don't confuse it. Because if you confuse it, you'll think that you have to be qualified by what you do to preach the gospel. And you'll confuse people and make them think that being saved is because of something that they do. And you won't be an effective soul winner that way. I, you'll leave people thinking, you know, I, I can never be like you. It's amazing, actually, that any of us, that people could look at us, but, you know, we don't know the hearts. We don't hear the things that go on in the minds of each believer. And so, you know, the fact of the matter is, if I were to put on the screen today some of the thoughts that you've had since you've been saved, we'd all be shocked. And we don't know that about you, and you don't know that about any of us. We don't know those things, but if we were to judge that on the basis of your salvation, we'd say, ah, oh, you know, that's, I don't know. But, you know, people look at a soul winner and think, well, this person's so saved and so enthusiastic about it that they're preaching the gospel, and so they must be just a wonderful person. And you don't, you don't win souls. The person, the soul winner, is not a soul winner because he's such a great Christian. I just want to, I want to, I'm not telling you, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a good testimony. I'm not trying to undermine the Christian walk, but I'm trying to put to rest the notion that the reason we win the lost is because of, we've got such a good testimony. A lot of Christians won't go soul winning because they're concerned about their testimony. And they're actually missing something in their life that would encourage them in their testimony. Let me ask you a question. Miracles or great works of God, do they come before or after faith? And obedience. <coughs> after. God always does a great work after we obey. And a, 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 a Christian who does not win souls, who does not preach the gospel and win the lost, is an individual who is not going to feel right, and they're going to struggle having a good testimony. You, you do what you're supposed to as a Christian, you'll feel good enough to want to uh, do right, and you'll feel good enough, you'll feel qualified after you do what you're supposed to do. So the qualification follows obedience, follows faith, not, not uh, vice versa. Okay, so don't go soul winning because, well, you know what, you know, I've never, I've never cursed after I was saved, or I've never this or that or whatever. You know, I'd share the gospel with my friends if they didn't, you know, know some things about me. Listen, your friends aren't going to get saved because you're a great person. Your friends are going to get saved because Jesus is the perfect, sinless Lamb of God. And He died on the cross for their sins. Same way you got saved. Okay? Now, I'm not saying the testimony isn't important. Don't, don't go somewhere that we haven't gone. But I want to lay to rest the reason or the qualification for soul winning. And it is not because of what you do. So, your assurance of salvation will help you with your soul winning, and your soul winning will help your assurance. Did you hear me? Your assurance of salvation will help you with, be effective with your soul winning. When you know what the gospel is, plain and simple, and you're confident about it, you'll be a better soul winner. But when you're a better soul winner, you'll have better assurance. Uh, study the simplicity of the gospel and the promises for eternal life. That's just kind of a, uh, kind of a side note there. And then I put a couple of times John 3. John 3, John 3, John 3. Memorize John 3. Don't try to come up with your gospel presentation. I'm not talking about presentation today. We'll talk about that in the future. But my friend, nobody understands the simplicity of the gospel better than Jesus, right? If I were to ask you, who in the Bible or who today knows the gospel and understands it more concisely, more clearly, and more accurately than anyone else. Couldn't we say God knows better than anyone? You know, so many people that preach the gospel disagree with Jesus' presentation of it. I'm not bashing today, but you know, John MacArthur doesn't agree with Jesus about the gospel. John Piper doesn't agree with Jesus about the gospel. They believe in lordship salvation. They don't believe in salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. They believe in repentance of works or turning from sin salvation. They don't believe in faith toward Jesus Christ. I'm not bashing individuals. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Don't, and don't misunderestimate what I'm saying either. 
Okay. Uh, the reality of it, though, is that the best place to preach the gospel and the best way to preach the gospel is simply. Sometimes we think that people, you know, they're so technical and they like, you know, nuances so much that we need to present the gospel with technicalities and nuances in order for it to appeal to them. And the fact of the matter is that Jesus Christ said anyone that comes to him needs to come as a child. And if you think a child can understand some of the complicated gospels that are preached by evangelical preachers, my friend, they could never be saved. And the preachers would never believe that they could be saved either on the way they present the gospel. John 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the gospel. And you could memorize that, couldn't you? Uh, Jesus, I mean, just John 3. Uh, I think every Christian ought to have John 3 memorized. So there's your homework. There's a project for you. Start. Start memorizing John chapter 3. And you say, well, I, you know, I don't know, just memorize it. And you'll be amazed at how it'll help you with your soul winning and how much you'll understand as a result of it. Call. Uh, that's pretty small font. Uh, I'm sorry about that. A believer who desires to know and fulfill God's eternal purpose in his life will soon discover that the most important purpose in his life is to be a soul winner. Do you hear me? The most important purpose in your life is to be a soul winner. How many of y'all want to know God's will for your life? How many want to fulfill God's eternal purpose in this life? Don't we? I want to know God's will for my life. You will not be revealed anything additional until you do the things that God wants for you. Okay, let me give you a for instance. Let's just use my, my pathetic self for an illustration of it. I always wanted to be a preacher. Uh, when I was, shortly after I was saved, I, I turned my sister's little, uh, she had a little uh, doll bed that my uncle made her, I would turn it up on end, and I would preach to the whole family all the time. I'd preach the gospel, I'd preach about sin. I was a railing, uh, angry preacher at uh, <laughs> four years old. And uh, so, <laughs> I always wanted to be a preacher. Uh, if you had asked me, at eight years old, I had like I've always been interested in every occupation. I, you you name it, except for you know like maybe a designer, fabric designer, or something like that. Not interested in that. But you name it, I'm pretty much interested in it. There are things that I find to be boring, uh, but I'm interested in them to a certain degree. But you know what I've always wanted to be? A pastor, a preacher, and I've always felt called to be that. Uh, just my whole life. Matter of fact, I think I just grew up. My parents just said he's going to be a preacher someday. That's just what he's going to be. And so, um, man, I got to, I got to, I got to remember what I, my point in that is. Rocket surgery. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be a rocket surgeon. <laughs> um, okay. What I want to say is this: I'm from Salina, Kansas. My wife used to say about Kansas people, Kansas people don't leave Kansas. They just don't. They just stay in Kansas. Yeah, it's actually not true, but uh, it's there's a little bit of truth too. Kansas people don't move away, and if they do, they move. What's that? Yeah, we're from Kansas, right, Lee? Yeah. So, see, it's not true. Okay, uh, but we have family land in Kansas. I mean, we have connections, family land. You know, where you know it's generational. You. You stay with the land and that sort of thing. And, and all our families are from Can all my family's from Kansas. If you'd asked me at any stage in my life until I moved to South Florida whether or not I'd ever end up in South Florida and ever plant a church here and be here the rest of my life, it just wouldn't have happened. Well, how'd I get here? Well, I'll tell you how I got here. I became a soul winner. That's how I got here. So I got to South Florida. People say, you know, Pastor, you're from Kansas. What do you think about Florida people? I love them. I love Florida people. You know why I love Florida people? Well, they're not just Florida people here. Really, nobody's from Florida. Very few people are. And the people here are not very easy to, uh, to like, humanly speaking. Yeah. They're not even American. Oh, wait a minute. Well, no, no, it's, it's really true. You know, uh, Tony... I wish Tony was here this morning. He should be here. Tony 
Wednesday night came over. He's like, I was in Tennessee. He said in Dollywood, they were playing Christmas music with, with Jesus. They were talking about Jesus. And I met everywhere I went, there were like Christians everywhere. <laughs> Believers. And I said, Tony, that's the way it is in America. And he said, I guess I've never really seen people outside Florida. You know, Florida people are just not American. I mean, they're, they're, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm, I'm being honest with you. Uh, they're from all the other countries in the world, and they bring with them their pagan culture and traditions. And even the ones that are that are here, oftentimes very, very liberal, anti-God. You now that's just that's the background of it, and that's just not the way I was raised. And I'll be honest with you, as a Christian, it's kind of outside of my comfort zone. But you know why I live in South Florida? Why I'm going to probably be here the rest of my life? Because I became a soul winner, and this is the best harvest field in the world. And there are, there are better lost people here than there are anywhere else in the world. I mean, just the harvest is just awesome here. And how do you know God's will for your life? Well, it'll be involved with how, how you win lost people. You say, Pastor, but I'm not full-time. Yes, you are. You're, you're a Christian 24-7. You, you vocationally may not be a pastor, but that's my job. I, it's my calling. But your job is your calling. But your calling involves you as the person that you are, man, woman, boy, or girl. It involves you being who you are and being a soul winner. And if you want to know God's will about specifics in your life, you better become a soul winner because God, that's how God reveals His will for you. It, you know, he'll give you the where, the how, the, all those things. And He'll involve all the things, even your occupation in life. And, you know, who I married? Everything had to do with being a soul winner. That's a fact. And so, you want to know God's will for your life, be a soul winner. That's the first and simplest thing, and a believer is called to be a soul winner. Uh, the, the last words of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you ought to be concerned about what Jesus said a believer does. Uh, three of the Gospels. This is Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee. This is after the resurrection, and after Jesus, is when He's getting ready to ascend to heaven. Verse 17, when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Verse 19 and 20 are a purpose statement for your life. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Pastor, should I baptize people? I'd be happy if you did. I'd be very glad if you did. Uh, you know, I usually do most of the baptism and baptizing around here, but there's nothing in the Bible that says that somebody that you win to Christ, you can't baptize. And so just go right on ahead. Uh, who is this written to? Well, specifically, it's written to the 11 disciples that were with him, but it's a purpose statement for them, and that's what they did when they founded the church. When, well, the Jesus founded the church, but when they were the foundation of the church, when they began to do the work of the church, they taught all nations. What did they teach them? The gospel. They baptized them. They taught them to observe all things. That's the calling of every believer, is to, teach the God, or to preach the gospel and to teach the word of God. Uh, not only are you supposed to be a soul winner, you're supposed to be a teacher. Here's Mark. This is afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? You believe, you'll be saved. And by the way, the and is baptized. That's additional. It's not requirement for salvation. And then he gives signs. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So that's Mark 16. Last words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Go ye therefore, and go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. Okay. We may not get here again, so let me just tell you who you ought to preach the gospel to, who you ought to reach. Everybody. Okay, moving forward. Uh, Luke, chapter 24, last, last words of Jesus in Luke. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. 
Then open ye their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye at Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now there's a secret there, endued with power from on high. This is going to be how to be a soul winning person, the person that you are. Obviously you're going to need ability you don't have. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit to get ahead of ourselves a little bit. This is in Acts. This is Luke and some further information, additional information. In chapter 1, verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. You know, most Christians are more concerned about trying to figure out the future and preach about, you know, instead of preaching prophecy of this is what the Bible says, we try to figure out what's going to happen on the basis of what is happening. Uh, we, we want to predict the future more than we want to. Uh, do what God wants us to do. But one, Acts 1 verse 8, this is another scripture memory verse for you. Acts 1 8, But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And these are the last words of Jesus. You want to know what you're supposed to do, then you need to take commands from your leader. Who's your leader? Jesus is. And if Jesus said, preach the gospel, then that's your purpose. That's your purpose in life. So the person, the soul winner, is a person who is saved, and the person, the soul winner, is a person who is called. How many believers are called to preach the gospel? What if, what if a believer has a bad testimony? <laughs> is, he, is he called to preach the gospel? Yes. He's still called to preach the gospel. Your testimony has nothing to do with your calling. Do you hear me? Most believers won't preach the gospel because of their testimony. You know, I'm just not the kind of person that, that declares my faith. And, you know, people just, you know, if I try and do that, people say, that's unnatural. That's not. No, it's natural for a believer to preach the gospel because that is your purpose. And you'll never be fulfilled until you perform your purpose, your calling. You're called to preach the gospel if you're saved. I just want to convince you of that. So many believers have excuses for not being an effective soul winner. And the reason you're not an effective soul winner isn't because you can't do it. It's because you're not convinced about your call. And if you understand that you're called, you'll understand that you have to do it not through your strength or your ability. You're going to do it with God's power. But you're going to be you when you preach the gospel. Uh, read Acts chapter 2 sometime when this, what Jesus prophesied happened. What was the description of Peter when all the people of Jerusalem from around the world that were there for Pentecost saw them preach the gospel and speak in languages that they didn't know? How was Peter described? What? Well, first of all, they said they were drunk. You know, these guys got to be drunk. How can they? They can't talk in other languages. They got to be drunk. Well, nobody gets more intelligent when they're drunk, so strike one. Okay? Uh, what was the second thing they said about the disciples? Uh, yeah. No, they, they said they were unlearned and ignorant men. They perceived. I mean, how, how would you feel about, well, you know, uh, Brother John won a lost person. That's amazing because he's an unlearned and ignorant man. <laughs> yeah. Brother John prides himself on his uh, education. Right? He went to Cornell University. He's an engineer. What did you say? Well, I was just thinking, they thought Peter was a fisherman. He was. He was a Galilean. So, yeah. He right. spoke like a southerner, except he was from the north. <laughs> I mean, you talk about looking sound and ignorant. He was like, how's this guy doing this? Well, he didn't do it in his power. So let me ask you a question. Who's qualified? Yeah, yeah I don't, it doesn't matter if you're learned or unlearned. Was Paul unlearned and ignorant? No. Was Luke unlearned and ignorant? No. No. Uh, in, in other words, who's called to preach the gospel? Learn people or unlearned people? Yes. Everybody. Yes. Everyone's called to preach the gospel. See, a lot of times you think, oh, you know, I mean, yeah, sure, pastor wins people, but I mean, he, his mom made him memorize the Bible when he was a kid. My mom tried to make me memorize the Bible when I was a kid. You know? Uh, 
Uh, you know, of course he could preach the gospel. You know, he went to Christian school and he had Christian parents and he went to church and went to Bible college and worked in churches and, and then went to seminary and then worked in churches and that's just all he's ever known. Yes. And that qualifies me because... Well, it actually doesn't qualify me at all. I'm qualified to preach the gospel because I'm saved and I'm called. And you can take your circumstances and be the most effective soul winner that you know the reason being that you are saved and called. I want to talk about the person of the soul winner today. And it's important for you to know, it's important for every one of us to get that I am a soul winner because I'm saved and because I'm called. Not because I'm unlearned. Not because I'm learned. The fact of the matter is, is that education is a put off to some people. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Brother John said, Cornell University engineer. People are like, well, I ain't talking to you. <laughs> Brother Charles, an engineer, ooh, he's too smart for me. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, I mean, saved, learned, ignorant, no, it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with your calling. Do you get that? I'm just, I just want to just beat it over and over and over again. You're a soul winner, not because of what you do, not because of what you know. You're a soul winner because you're saved and because you're called. All right, all right, so saved and called. What's missing? The answer to that is nothing. In order to be you, the person, the soul winner, in order to be effective as such, you need to be saved and you need to be called. Go ahead and mess with it, uh, Tim. That's fine. Uh, but what else do you need beyond that? Not a thing in the world. Okay. All right, the notions. 